welcome to, to those of you joining us. Uh, my name is Olegri Soto. I'm the director of HES admissions. Welcome. Um, we'll, we'll wait a couple minutes just as people um, trickle in. So we still have about a minute or two to go get some, some water or run to the restroom, get some tea. Uh, and we'll be with you very soon. Again, welcome uh, all, all of you joining us uh, uh, from, from near and afar. Uh, we'll start in about a minute or, or so. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, the LGBTQ plus community at HES. Uh, my name is Olivia Soto, the Director of Admissions. Uh, we'll be with you very soon. I uh, hope you've all had a great day. It was a beautiful day over here in Cambridge. Incredible weather. Um, and Good opportunity to get some sun. So it's been a good one. Good, good fall day. Again, I see, see, hi, hi, Claire. Uh, Claire saying hi to everyone. We'll be with you very soon. Okay, and we'll, we'll get started. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I will share um, my PowerPoint. I'm gonna turn off my camera now and I'll speak for about 10 minutes or so. And then uh, again, we'll, we'll get to the to the main theme of our conversation today, which is talking about the LGBTQ plus community HES. We have a great panel for you uh, led by uh, Assistant Dean Steph Calcio and, and three incredible student panelists, um, Peyton White, uh, Claire Sundberg, and Nathan Samayo. So again, I'm going to turn off my camera now and we'll, we'll start chatting. Okay, so again, welcome. Uh, for those of you who may have just uh, joined us, uh, my name's Olevi Soto. This is, this is me, in case you didn't get a chance to see me. Um, and uh, I, uh, I started as a director of admissions at, at HCS uh, a year and a half ago at this point. I was an MDiv 2011 uh, student. I absolutely loved my time here. It was a great experience and uh, I actually had a chance to work in this admissions office right after uh, gradu graduating. And um, after Wor working around the university in a couple of different capacities, I was able to return last year uh, to a, a, a beloved community here back at HES. So it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be back here on campus. So again, I'll speak for about 10 minutes um, just to give you a big uh, overview of, of what HES is. So HES is really, uh, you know, the main, the main three points uh, when you walk away with are, are these listed here. It was the first divinity school in the United States and the most religiously pluralistic in the world. It's, it's an incredible place uh, because it educates students from all sorts of fields to and trains them um, for all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, it prepares them for all sorts of endeavors. Um, it's, it's a non-religiously affiliated school uh, and it, it trains students in both the academic study religion and in preparation for leadership. Again, in religious, governmental, and a wide range of service organizations. We have more than 45 faith traditions represented in the student body. And uh, even those, of course, who are not religiously affiliated. And we have 500 plus recurring worship services. Um, it's, again, uh, it, it's a place where applicants often wonder what career paths are available? Um, our degree programs lead to infinite pathways with alumnus in every field and industry who value ethical leadership, 
religious literacy and service-oriented, mission-driven work. Graduates often describe developing skills such as deep listening, uh, ethical reasoning, uh, bridging divides successfully, and navigating difficult conversations uh, as part of their experience. So you might be wondering, well, who, who's here at HES? This is just to give you a snapshot of the committee at HES. Uh, this is actually data from the incoming class uh, that just joined us uh, over six weeks ago. Um, you'll see that we have 96 MTS students. That's our most popular program. And I'll explain a little bit more about different degree programs very soon. We have 52 MDF students, 12 MRPL. This is Master of Religion and Public Life, a newly launched degree program. I, I will talk more about that four special students and two THM students. The THM is the Master of Theology, a one-year degree program. The uh, incoming class uh, has 55% identifying as female, 34% as male, and 7% 7, 7 identifying as non-binary. The average age is 28 years old, and the age range of the students enrolled goes from 21 all the way through 68. HES students reported over, again, 45 different religious affiliations, and I would say the most interesting number and the one I, as, as part of the admission team, I'm most proud of is the fact that we have 121 colleges and universities represented in the incoming class, which means we have students coming in from a diverse array of institutions and academic training. And that's, that's really exciting for us. And of course, you'll, you'll find uh, the fact, you know, fun fact, we have 62 languages spoken and represented just in this incoming class. As I mentioned, um, we have uh, four degree programs. Um, the two-year Master Theological Studies program or the MTS, this one offers a broad study in religion with opportunities to concentrate in one of 18 areas of focus. Students enroll to prepare for doctoral programs in religion or a related discipline, or honestly, just to approach another field or profession such as law, um, journalism, public policy, education, arts, medicine, you name it from a perspective, perspective enriched by theological study. The three-year master uh, of the divinity program or the MD is really for 21st century spiritual leaders. Students learn the arts of ministry here, broadly conceived of course, including preaching, pastoral care, and community organizing. And they link theory and practice with field work placements in settings around the globe. The master of theology uh, program or the THM this is for applicants who uh, already hold an MDiv, and it's designed to allow students to explore a topic in great depth or delve into um, a new topic that impacts their ministry, whatever that might look like. Oh, excuse me. The Master of uh, Religion and Public Life, or the MRPL, is a recently launched degree program. This enables uh, experienced professionals diverse fields to develop a deep understanding of the complex role that religion plays in the work. Through coursework, a shared seminar with other professionals, and a final project that deepens understandings of religion within their fields, leaders develop the religious literacy to effectively address critical challenges facing the world today. Okay, so you've, you've, had, a, you've had a sense of, of, again, our degree programs. Now, this would be, oh, I think, uh, let me, let me stop sharing my slide for a second, because I think I might be having issues sharing. Just one quick second. Here I come first. I'll be, you can probably see me again. Let me, for some reason, it paused. And I believe you can see that now. Correct? I think so. Um, Steph, Claire, panelists, can you confirm that you can you can see it? We're looking at a slide right now that says Harvard Divinity School. It's the one that has the most okay. religiously pluralistic gap. The first right. one. Thank you, Peyton. Just want to make sure I appreciate it. Okay. All right. So 
again, this is the incoming class profile, the degree programs, and okay. So I'll send, in fact, this is this is where I had left off. So HS faculty of divinity are among the most uh, really accomplished in, in, in terms of scholarship, religion, and practitioners of ministry in the world, with over 80 faculty and guest lecturers teaching more than 200 courses every year. Our faculty includes some of the world's top scholars of Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, and many other traditions. As you can see on the slide, 54% of our faculty are tenured women, and more than one third specialize in non-Christian traditions. In addition to the nearly 200 courses offered at HES, Students also have access to courses across the entire university, as well as throughout the Boston Theological Interreligious Consortium, or the BTI. Uh, this is a consortium of 10 theological institutions of higher ed in the Boston area. What's great about the BTI is that it offers um, easy cross-registration, as well as a range of other resources across institutions. And what's great is that for MDiv and MTS students, you can actually do up to 50% of your coursework uh, outside of HES. So that means that students can truly customize their HES experience to create their, their unique path to the program and they get the preparation each student needs for their goals. And honestly, if none of the thousands of courses available to you fit the bill, you can also work directly with HES faculty to do an independent study. So it's pretty safe to say that no two HES students uh, have the same transcript. Now, the faculty. Uh, now we're, we're talking about the student life. Uh, I know that when I was a student, I, I was definitely um, enthralled by the faculty, but I, I, the students, my, my fellow students, my peers were, were the ones that really captivated me uh, in many ways and, and made this such a special place. Um, you'll see that the Office of Student Life supports 35 student organizations every year. And it's easy to start your own, even if there's something that doesn't exist that you think should. Some examples of student organizations are Queer Rights, Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, the HES Garden Group, um, and Third Chapter, actually. This is a group for students over 50 years old. These student organizations host over 60 student-led events each year, in addition to the 500-plus return events that I, I mentioned previously. And this, this includes weekly worship services hosted by faith-based student organizations. Uh, there are also two main weekly events uh, at HES, noon service on Wednesday and committee tea on Tuesdays. And students have access to events and organizations across Harvard as well. It's not just HES community, but across Harvard. The other thing that I want to mention during, again, my, my main H, uh, HES admission spiel is that we, we're, we're very fortunate in the sense that we can be very generous. Um, and we, we offer uh, generous institutional grant aid for students enrolling in both the MDiv or the MTS programs. Uh, actually, approximately 90% of our students in those programs receive grant aid, uh, the majority of which is need-based need grant aid. HES does have a small pool of merit aid that's awarded based on the overall strength of the application. But honestly, we strongly encourage everyone to submit a financial aid application so you can be considered for need based aid. Our baseline need based aid package is a 75% tuition grant. So, as you're planning for graduate school and thinking about your budget, that's a good number to use. For folks with more need, we also offer higher packages that cover 100% of tuition, and some even come with a living stipend. Um, merit awards, uh, they, they cover 100% of tuition and include a living stipend as well. Now, this, this is just, uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of information here about the, the main application components and, and the timeline. Um, we have other events that are um, going into detail about all these different application components. So I encourage you to, to attend those if, if you're willing and able. Um, what I'll draw your attention to here is the timeline. You'll see that we launched the app, our application just a month ago. We have until January 6th. And so it closes. Uh, something we'll, we're, we're piloting this year for the first time ever is doing interviews uh, for select candidates. And those will start late January, early February or so. And then after that, we would uh, release decisions in mid-March. So that would be the flow of, uh, of the cycle. So, um, so just keep that in mind if, if you're interested in applying for this cycle. And then uh, 
honestly, just stay connected. Reach out to us. Come to more events like that, like the one we're, we're hosting today. Um, I want to put a, a plug in for um, our, our upcoming virtual open house, which is happening on Tuesday, um, November 9th. So uh, we we hope you, you you can join us then. It's a great opportunity to meet with more students, more faculty, more staff. Um, and actually, if you um, click on this, in the, I'm sorry, not click, scan this QR code, uh, you'll see the, the whole list of upcoming events. And it's an easy way to register for those. We also have a great admissions blog. Uh, our Instagram is a, it's a good way to stay in touch and, and, and see um, a lot of what's going on over here. And of course, don't, don't hesitate to reach out with any questions at any point, okay? We're here to help and, and to answer any questions. All right, so uh, we're, let, let's get on to the main event now, which is our student panel. So uh, again, I, I mentioned we, we are uh, fortunate to have Assistant Dean Seth Gauto, uh, Assistant Dean for Student Affairs, uh, lead us in this great panel, talk about the LGBTQ community at HES, and you'll see that we have uh, Nathan Samayo, Claire Sunberg, and Peyton White. Um, um, you'll see that the two are in the MDiv program, one in the MTS, so all graduating in 2023. I'm going to invite them now to turn on uh, their cameras. I'm going to stop sharing and I'll pass it off to you, Seth. Thanks so much, Air Davies. Uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to be with you all today. Um, I'm Steph Gauchel, Assistant Dean for Student Affairs, and I use he or they pronouns. Just as a little context, I'm the main support person for students at HDS around academic, personal, medical need. Um, anything that's going on that you need support with, I, I'm one of the go-to folks at HDS. Um, but I'm really excited that we have three wonderful students with us today. Uh, and just in terms of format, um, it's going to be pretty casual. I've, I've sent them a few questions uh, to think about in advance. So I'm going to give them each a chance to introduce themselves and respond to the first question. We'll move through the questions. And then hopefully, if we have time at the end, um, you all, anyone uh, tuning in, are able to send in questions on the chat, and we can answer those as well. Uh, so the first question really is just in terms of thinking about LGBTQ experience and HDS. Um, first of you, I don't mind just introducing yourself, if you want to share um, pronouns, degree, anything you want to share. Um, and then if you can speak to any, you know, positive uh, experiences you've had around LGBTQ identity and HDS experiences. Um, and Claire, you're on my left. Do you mind if I ask you to go first? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can do someone else if you'd like. <laughs> That's that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I guess I, I am here to speak in some capacity, so I might as well start now. Um, my name is Claire Sunberg. I am a first year MTS student, so I just got here. Uh, I use they or she pronouns, and I mostly, just for fun context, mostly grew up in Toronto, Canada. So if there are any Canadians watching this, hello. And hello to everyone else as well. But, you know, <laughs> um, any positive experiences I have had, I am just so excited to be here. Um, I kind of jumped right in at HDS, uh, helping lead the queer rights group. And we just had our noon service this yesterday. Um, and that's been probably my most positive, the most, the most like standout positive experience for me has been getting to be involved in, in queer rights. Um, I was involved in uh, the like queer group in my undergrad um, and most of our events were kind of centered around uh, arguing our right to be on the campus that, that we were on. And so for me, it has been such a fresh, fresh breath of air, breath of fresh air um, <laughs> uh, to be a part of queer rights and be planning a, a like queer noon service. And uh, we did a crafting picnic and just kind of be in each other's company. Um, that has been really, really a positive experience for me. Wonderful, thank you very much. 
Nathan, would you mind going next? Yeah, thank you, Steph, and thank you, Claire. And I'm grateful to be on this call with y'all because, Claire, I don't think we've met formally, but it's nice to see you, and I love everyone on this call. Um, but yeah, y'all, my name is Nathan Samayo. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm from Seattle, Washington. I identify as queer and specifically gay. Um, and I'm a second year master divinity student. And I'm a youth pastor in a small little town called Ipswich, Massachusetts. Um, but yeah, just to speak on some positive experiences that I've had here at HDS, I think the number one is that I have a really affirming um, community and friend group. Um, most of them are queer also. I don't know. Uh, if that's who I'm just attracted to to kick it with and stuff, but um, I have a pretty large community here and a lot of them identify as queer. So to have that kind of affirmative presence around me, especially when school just gets tough, like it's really good to be in that space. Um, and I think also this is different from my undergrad. I know I have a similar experience to Claire around the undergrad that I went to and just trying to advocate for my own presence on being on campus. But the interesting thing here is um, kind of understanding queerness as I don't want to take this super heady, but even like a methodology or thinking about queerness in the ways that it really permeates all aspects of life. So it's not necessarily only my gender expression or my sexuality, but it's the way that queerness allows me to kind of fully express the fullness of who I am. And even to see how that integrates into my work here has been a very different experience from my undergrad experience, but also it's a lot more, um, I feel like my work is a lot more intimate and I feel like uh, there's a deeper meaning of kind of the theological questions that I ask um, kind of in my, in my work here at HDS. And I have a couple more, um, I'm a part of different kind of um, advocacy and uh, social justice kind of driven groups. Uh, one of them being an abolitionist group here at Harvard. And it's interesting the way that a lot of our work has been very intersectional, specifically um, the organizations that we work with in the larger Boston area are black led organizations that work on abolition. And uh, one of the groups specifically called Black and Pink that we worked with here in Boston is kind of a black trans um, led group around abolition and how we kind of stand in solidarity with people on the inside. And so seeing the way that queerness is also an identity and uh, kind of a politic while we do this kind of intersectional social justice driven work. And I'm, I feel like I'm getting super wordy now because it's a lot to say, but I'll go ahead and leave it at that for now. We can unpack that a little bit later. Thank you, Steph. Thank you, Nathan. And Peyton. Hey, y'all. Um, my name is Peyton, Peyton White. Um, I use um, he or they pronouns. Um, I identify as queer in terms of both sexuality and gender. Um, and I'm originally from uh, a place called Pikeville, Tennessee. Um, and I attended undergrad at the University of Tennessee. Um, so big love to my Southerners and my Appalachian folks. Um, yeah, my, my positive experiences, mm, I have had many. Um, and and, and they, mostly, um, they mostly come from, from the people that I've met here. Um, they mostly come from the, the people who I've chosen, who have chosen me um, to, to be my people, right? Like I feel, um, I feel like home is where you can let your guard down, right? And uh, while I'm really like cautious and very, uh, and very sometimes pessimistic about where that is possible and like how that can work, um, I, I have found myself um, uh, letting my guard down at HDS, uh, you know, for better or for worse. And I think that speaks to um, just the, the, the way that, that the, how to put this? I mean, the gays are everywhere at HDS. Let's just say that. Like, I mean, like the way that, the way that like we permeate the fabric of this institution and the way that, they're they're like the culture of HDS to me and I don't know if it's like Nathan where it's like just the people that I'm attracted to the people I want to be around the people that that want to be around me but I just feel like what's the culture of Harvard Divinity School without like this queer centered and queer facing um project um yeah the way that the way that being here has just felt so healing to me because I've spent so so much time in places where I'm just scrapping, where I'm just like fighting for space and fighting to fighting to move. 
and and you know there are still challenges but being around people who understand their queerness and my queerness as uh, as a mechanism of divinity and as a gift um, does not go cannot cannot go unsaid right like we can't take that for granted that's that's like the bare barest of minimums but we, we we are so starred for that bare minimum that like I would be totally remiss if I didn't explicitly name that as one of my most positive experiences um, at HDS so far so yeah I think I'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, that's a good uh, segue into thinking about where have there been challenges, if you've if you experienced challenges, whether personally or thinking about the academic component of queerness or LGBTQ identity. Um, and if anyone wants to go first, I'll just leave it that way. Something's burning. If not, I can put you on the spot. <laughs> but we go with Nathan this time first. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. And um, I don't, I don't, I, I, this is kind of an unformed thought, but what I'm thinking about is just as queerness is everywhere, so is homophobic rhetoric, right? And homophobic ideology. And so the interesting thing is HDS is a part of the larger Harvard University. And so I've experienced my queerness differently in the ways that I've been impacted by people's comments throughout Harvard University in like kind of different capacities. And what I mean by that is um, being in other spaces around Harvard, I've noticed a kind of, I, sh I should say culture shift around like the acceptance of the fullness of who I am in certain spaces, certain events. I'm not gonna like throw other Harvard schools, but like certain events I've been to and the ways that queerness has been talked about as like um, maybe like a biological conversation or talking about it in some places like where they talk about public policy and how queerness kind of uh, is explained in those kind of settings. I've been exposed to some kind of harmful rhetoric and harmful ideology, just kind of across Harvard University, because that's just the nature of being a part of a divinity school that's open to, you can take classes at other places and check out different webinars and stuff and um, kind of talks and stuff like that. So I've been exposed to um, rhetoric that may have been harmful or ideology that has been harmful to me. And I say that because just as uh, queerness is everywhere, so is homophobic rhetoric and ideology. So. All I'm saying is that's not separate from Harvard University as an institution. So I'll probably go ahead and leave it at that. Thank you, Nathan. Peyton, do you want to go, go next? Do I want to or will I? Those are different questions. The answer is I will. Um, so yeah, I feel like this is an important question. Um, and there's a lot to be said here. And I think the the way I'll answer this, like basically just reflects um, the extra work that is asked of, of queer people um, in certain um, contexts. And, um, you know, I spoke to feeling like I could let my guard down for better force. Sometimes it's for worse, I'm gonna be real. Like sometimes, even though that comfortability is there and I know I have my shooters out here, well, maybe I shouldn't say like that, but I have these people out here that are, that are going to like uh, ride for me, whatever kind of rhetoric you wanna use. I have people that are going to defend me and love me. Um, and even though that is the case, and I do feel comfortable in many ways, uh, not totally, not all the time, because there are conversations that happen where like you, like your, your personhood gets thrown up for debate, like as a, like as a knowledge project, right? Like people, like I say, I, I say all the time, like people are not books and I did not consent for you to read me. Don't, don't come for me unless I called you. Um, and there are just certain times where we'll be talking about you know, I don't know, the weather, and then all of a sudden, you know, queerness. So it, it's just a lot that in, in the way that it pops out um, in, in a very visceral way uh, in class can be kind of jarring because, you know, adding a, it feels as though like sometimes adding a layer of analysis that includes queerness is a, is a little bonus that we get if we were good. And, um, that's kind of that's kind of annoying. But the great thing about a place like HDS is that you know you can you can push back. Um, and well, you can you can't. But um, depending on on circumstances, we're all constrained by various levels of like you know the world. But 
um, I have found from my experience, and then of course I'm saying this like, uh, you know, as my whiteness saves me all the time, um, and, but I have found that my experience has been um, quite empowered um, when I do feel that I have been harmed. Um, so I will just throw that in as a little like extra thing. Thanks, Peyton. And Claire. Uh, thank you both so much for what you've just said. Uh, I would say in reflecting on this question, I came up with a similar answer um, in that one of the challenges um, that I have experienced is the temptation for either myself or for others to, uh, when, we're, when we're talking about queerness in class, to kind of separate it out um, as like a, a subject um, that is, there's a word I'm looking for, like just floats around in the air and doesn't directly impact um, people in the room. Um, and at least from my experience so far, having only been here for since August, um, however many months that is, uh, I will say I have not experienced uh, in the same way at all as I did in, in my undergrad. I have not experienced that kind of separation as, a, as an opportunity for people to say very negative uh, things um, about queerness, but there is something about that um, conversational separation that is sometimes unintentionally asked of students in class. Um, there's something about that that I think is um, a challenge to notice when you're doing it, to overcome, to kind of ask questions about why we feel the need to um, speak about identity in class in a, in a particular way. Thank you very much, Claire. I'm really just grateful for the three of you sharing. I think it's super important when people are trying to discern is HDS the right spot, uh, particularly when we're talking about marginalized experiences or historically marginalized identities that people get to have make informed decisions. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of what you've shared related to the challenges and the positive experiences. Um, so the next question is about resources or things that you've been involved with. What are the things that um, you found really particularly useful? Maybe we'll start with Peyton this time. Sure. Um, I think some of the most um, invaluable supports um, that I have found in my time here, uh, I've already mentioned, are, are like my community primarily. That's like the first stop, right? Uh, I like to think about the institution of Harvard Divinity School as, as a, a, a site and location for love. Like the institution can't love you, but you can love people here and they will, and then they can love you back. So, and, and we've also spoken to, to the huge array of like um, ages and life experiences and like um, my, like the wisdom that is collectively held by all these, all these different folks who've come like there are like I'm in class. I have I have classmates and and beloved friends who are who are truly like some of my queer elders who like I can look to for you know like like um, heritage for like feeling some type of way. And there are you know people who are my age and younger than me that are teaching me new things all the time about how to deal with things that are new to me but not new to them and and the the collective experiences that we're able to sort of pull into this sort of like cup of protection and nourishment that I drink from all the time um it, it lands like nourishment just to be with um with such passionate people that's like I think the most important support for me um and then truly like the the staff at HDS like like y'all are 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 by and large um amazingly supportive um and um i'll particularly like shout out dean bartholomew as well um and her work is, is is so validating and 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 the folks like you steph who are who are working to 
to make this place anti-oppressive. Like the, it is in that process that I feel energized. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Peyton. And Claire, can I take it back to you, please? Yes, you can. <laughs> um, well, I, I would be remiss if I did not mention queer rights as a <laughs> potential resource for people. I'm gonna do a little, well, it's not really self-promotion, I guess, because you know, it's a conglomerate of people, but I will promote that conglomerate that I'm a part of, um, the queer rights group. Uh, I would also uh, shout out my particular uh, denominational counselor in the uh, United Methodist tradition, whose name is escaping me right now, but we've had great conversations. Um, and so, I mean, I can't speak to every denominational counselor because I've only met the one, but I would encourage any incoming students to kind of, if you, if that feels like an important um, connection for you to make, go ahead. That's been great for me. Um, my advisor, David Lambert, shout out, um, precious, precious human being. Uh, and, Apart from that, I would I would echo um, what Peyton has been been talking about as well um, in just the the community of students, peers, that whatever that word is, um, that has been really meaningful for me as well. Um, or I guess I should say is is starting to be meaningful. I've only been here a couple of weeks, so I don't know if I can you know, make, make that claim just yet, but um, it is really, really worth it to get to know, um, has been worth it for me to get to know my fellow students. Thank you very much. And Mason, how about you? Yeah, y'all are speaking right now. I just want to echo everything that y'all said. I'll just throw in one quick thing. Um, so the Office of Ministry Studies. Um, so I, if you do come to HDS, uh, I would say 99% of y'all are going to engage with the Office of Ministry Studies. They're the office that hosts um, the field education placements and folks who are looking to go into ministry, clinical, pastoral education, which those might just be uh, jargon right now, but it'll make sense down the road. But they've placed me at really good um, field education sites, sites that are very affirming, sites that have been um, very uh, integrative of my own kind of queer identity in the work that I want to do and in the ministry that I want to do. Um, and so having the Office of Ministry Studies and then all the internship sites that they are uh, aff affiliated with is another great resource, if especially you're looking to get off campus and do a field education placement uh, slash internship. So that's definitely a resource that I would look to to really put um, your identity into your practice. So I just want to go ahead and Shout out the Office of Ministry Studies for this one. Awesome, thank you very much. And then the last question that I had given to you all is if there's, uh, has anything been surprising to you related to LGBTQ plus issues or identities at HDS? Um, why don't we come full circle and Claire, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that. Um, yeah, I'll start in and just say, I think, I know we've, been talking a lot about um, the particular people um, that you meet in going to HDS who also go to HDS. Um, so sorry if this, if we're being a bit of a, a broken record, but um, I will say something that has been really like pleasantly surprising to me. And I feel like I didn't necessarily have low expectations for this, but um, I'm surprised all all the time by the people in my in my classes and uh, in them bringing up their experiences, the things that they've read. Um, and for me, I guess what I mean by surprised, because um, that could have a couple of different connotations, um, is like all the time uh, feeling stretched, like mentally stretched and challenged um, 
by what my my peers bring to the table. And I mean that in a very positive sense. I'm definitely a person that thinks we should always be kind of in, interrogating our, ourselves and our biases and uh, our particular context. And that is something that I have been really grateful for um, and also surprised by um, uh, in, in coming to HDS. Um, I've been really, I can't speak for everybody. I can only speak for myself, but personally that has been wonderful. Awesome, thank you very much, Claire. Nathan, how about you? Yeah, thanks, Claire. I just wanna add on to that too. I think, uh, so just to be um, transparent, I feel like I didn't necessarily go to a um, academically rigorous undergrad. And so the things that I have been exposed to at HDS has been phenomenal. Um, even if sometimes a professor talks about it in a way that I don't necessarily agree with, but still being exposed to queer literature and um, queer methodology and queer theory have just completely uh, expanded my worldview and it completely expanded kind of my way of thinking and the ways that I can do research, especially like I just took um, ethnographic methods in religious studies and the ways that we talked about queering anthropology didn't even know it's not just the um, integration of queerness into anthropology but it changes up your politics it changes up the ways that you integrate yourself into communities and so i think queerness on kind of the academic sense really allows us to challenge kind of these dominant structures these dominant research methods these dominant narratives in which interrupt all the ways that we thought about critically and opens these kind of new worldviews for us to be, um, to us to experience kind of the fullness of who we are and kind of the stuff that we study. So I just, yeah, on the academic sense, I would say that queerness uh, here at HDS has really brought in the way I think about the world and um, how I wanna be um, a social justice practitioner. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what I have to offer for that. Thank you, Nathan. And Peyton. You know, what a question. I think I'm like, like Claire said, I think I'm surprised all the time, like in different ways. Like I was surprised when I got here by just how like many of us there were and how like we run the world. Like I don't mind straight people as long as they're gay in public, I don't. And you know, so I've had a good time with just the sheer number of us, the way we run the world at this institution. I'm just kidding. But I that was surprising and wonderful. But then also, like on a realer note, like I have been so surprised and um, humbled by um, some of like my non-queer siblings and how loved and supported and held I have felt by them because I'm so used to being in spaces where um, non-queer people don't get it nor care to get it or um, or want to necessarily get it. And um, I came in with a lot of like, like I have to, like speaks again to the very first thing I said, right? About like the letting your guard down thing. And um, and of course, like my queer siblings have been hugely important to to that sort of letting go and, and, and taking like a deep breath, but also um, like some allies, the way that the allies have jumped out has been incredibly uh, beautiful and uh, just based on my like life experiences was was surprising to me. Thank you. Um, I'm really just so grateful for all of your comments. Uh, we do have, it looks like we have one question that's come through and then there's a second. It looks like the person uh, feels it's been answered. So I'll just start with the first and we also received a couple in advance. So the first question, um, are there full-time staff or student centers that work to directly support LGBTQ plus students at HDS? I'm happy to chime in too first on this one if it's because I think this is a question comes up, especially um, coming from undergrads where schools often and hopefully have an LGBT center that's supporting students. Um, it is different with grad schools. So there, there is one for Harvard, but it's really focused on the Harvard College students. Um, but then I'm just curious with you all, do you feel like there's um, spots that are really where LGBTQ is centered in a way that you feel that that support's available to you? I can speak to this, um, that I think that in terms of institutional support, 
my first thought is is again is again you is again Steph, um, and then um, we've already like shouted out and mentioned denominational counselors, um, and uh, I think for specific religious traditions, um, like the 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 bone structure, um, is can can be a really great and affirming place to be. Um, because sometimes that's who you need to hear it from the most and that's who you need to be supported by the most. And uh, yeah, in my experience, I think that is probably where I would go first. Any other add-ons on that one? Are you feeling okay? Okay. Um, yeah, and I appreciate, I appreciate that, Peyton. And it certainly is, it's part of my role um, to work with students around any identity-based needs or issues or um, and just in, and development itself. Um, and I certainly recognize that being trans identified adds a, a layer uh, to that too. Um, and oops, sorry, we had a couple other ones come through. Uh, one is a question about trans resources um, and for those who are transitioning during their time at Harvard. So could anyone speak to trans resources that you're aware of? <laughs> sorry, my dog barked. Hey Steph, sorry, I'm trying to find the question that you're reading off of so I can read it myself. Is it a private message? Or? No, it was, uh, it was something that came through through email from uh, a participant. So there's, I have three questions that admissions gave me. So it's really just inquiring about um, resources around trans resources. Uh, it made me think about like health, res health, health services, mental health components, um, but also even, you know, just even in terms of our campus, like it made me think of our um, all gender bathrooms, things like that. Yeah, I was also going to um, shout out the mental health services available. Um, I've, again, just got here. I have just started engaging with those resources. Um, and uh i'm i'm not a, a trans person i identify as non-binary um but i know there are people for whom both of those labels overlap interlock connect in some way um and so i think for, again i can only speak for myself so i think for me uh something that i was personally very excited for um, was the fact, again, within uh, the health services is that uh, they offer um, like nu nutritional counseling, which is maybe not something that you would strictly associate with um, gender identity or expression. Um, but I know for myself and for lots of my other uh, friends that are not cisgendered, um, there can there can be issues with with food in in there as well um, in terms of like how does it feel to be in my body um, and like what does it mean to to nourish yourself and those those kinds of questions. So I know that's maybe not the like traditional answer that you were looking for, but I know for myself those questions are all wrapped up um, together. So that I, I wanted to shout that out as an option that is, is available as well. I'm happy to offer this also, my, my experience as a staff might be different, um, but my experience being trans is that the, like the insurance has been amazing. Um, I don't use the Harvard Health Services, but um, my feedback from students is that there is also a queer, there's a significant amount of queer staff and then also queer informed um, practitioners, both in health services and in uh, uh, counseling and mental health services. And also there's a robust, like this area, uh, living in the Boston area, we have access to some of the best health services and current practices. Um, so that's really just a wealth of information. And I'll also note that I, I really appreciate the ways in which um, our office that works on Title IX issues is the Office for Gender um, Equity. It recently has changed names. And on the policy side, there's such attention uh, to gender-based harassment, anything related to gender. It's not just seen as being about um, 
it's just the way they look at gender is very broad and inclusive in ways that I appreciate uh, and seems for the support service side for the mental health piece. So I'd say the area, uh, I feel very privileged living in this area of being a trans person. Um, and then we had another question, any obstacles or microaggressions an LGBTQ plus student might be challenged with at HDS? Steph, may you read that question one more time now that we heard it the first time? Certainly. Any obstacles or microaggressions an LGBTQ plus student might be challenged with at HDS? Yeah, I can tap into this and this may be on the student level and more on the casual side. But I mean, the, the environment here at HDS is multi-religious, uh, multi-faith, however, whatever word you use to identify multiple religions coming together once. And so the exchange around people's identity and queerness, there's just as much as there's opportunity for inclusivity and ex expanding our worldviews, there's also this opportunity for contention. Right. And so I think, I mean, I think that's how we grow here as well is to really have uh, these critical conversations around people uh, and how we identify and people's belief frameworks. And so in terms of microaggressions and um, just uh, obstacles in regards to those exchange, I've, I've seen it happen kind of on the casual student level when people have uh, contentious views around um, a certain a certain thing. Um, but I think that's the growing space of being at HDS. Not that people have to, I'm not saying that people have to experience harm or anything. Like that. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. But the ways that we can expand kind of our worldviews, theologies, whatever, there's this exchange that happens on the casual level um, in which there is times when some people might have been hurt um, around what someone said. But luckily here at HDS, I felt how people are held accountable and are um, left for uh, to grow in kind of their ways of thinking. So yeah, I'll probably just mention that around obstacles and microaggressions. Thank you. Clara or Peyton, do you have anything you'd like to add? I was just gonna add that in terms of like um, microaggressions or instances of, of, of harm and obstacles that you'll encounter at HDS, um, that I think it's important to remember that like, um, you know, academic credentials and prestigious titles do not, um, do, do, do not necessarily mean that a person is like um, adept, skilled, or even empathetic to certain like identities and, and experiences or so you just because um, you're dealing with folks who, you know, are working students, faculty, whatever at Harvard doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's different than other institutions that you might have been in, in the past or other other contexts that you've been in. Um, in fact, sometimes I think that in the back of my mind thinking like, oh, you know, you should get it because of your role has actually led to to me being even more taken aback actually. So yet again, not like making an excuse for the fact that it happens, but I'll maybe like kind of a, uh, a warning, caveat, whatever you wanna, wanna say. I, I can add something as well. Um, I, I don't know if you just heard that skateboarder like whip past my window, um, <laughs> but um, if you did, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to add that for myself as like a non-binary person that does not always present my gender in like a traditionally androgynous way. Um, I know that, uh, something I have noticed is there are people who will remember to ask for pronouns um, when they're meeting someone if that person fits the mold of what they think is androgynous and that that happens everywhere that's not specific to HDS um, so I think I just would I would mention that as something that um, I've I've noticed and at the same time I also have been asked my pronouns 
at HDS more than I have in my entire life. So there's, there's two sides to that coin. Um, but, uh, I, I would just mention that as something that I've personally noticed a couple times. Great. Thank you very much. We had one more question that was emailed, but I also see that a new question came through with the Q&A. So I'm going to go with that one because um, I'm also aware we're getting close to time. Um, so Don Abram, who is a, an alum, MDiv19, uh, created Project Pews with the intentions to transform the hearts of those who are close, closed to the idea of inclusivity. And I was wondering if there's more projects like this being created at HDS. I can jump in here. I don't, this isn't specifically HDS, but I know a lot of people in their different field education placements um, or other kind of things they do outside of Harvard um, that they've been, ex um, had the opportunity to do through like a field education placement or something. Uh, and so if that is something that you're interested in doing. Uh, I'm sure if HDS doesn't have the placement for that already to create a project like that, that you can do a student initiated placement and find a way to get into that work. Um, but yeah, so that's a kind of field education opportunity there. Yeah, and if I might add just really quickly, um, it, most HDS classes culminate with a, with a project that could be like an academic paper or in many instances, we are very encouraged um, institutionally to be creative with the kinds of things that we want to do to wrap up our classes like and a lot of professors really encourage um, a wide array of projects um, and you're like that's one of the cool things about being here is how how you we are so encouraged to apply that which we are learning to what it is we do so whatever your project is as a person whatever it is that you're trying to do um, put it in conversation with who you are and with what you have learned and um, and you know we we make it work but yeah thank you Claire did you want to add anything okay I, I also I think uh, HDS as itself is an inclusivity project in a lot of ways I think we're always striving you know we know that there's always work to be done and as things evolve um, even if we feel like we're on top of something we know we need to constantly be growing so whether the question was meant as sort of a personal exploration that you might embark on, or if it's more what's available as resources, I'd, I'd like to hope that we're the whole project of HTS is around inclusivity. Um, but thank you, the three of you, so much uh, for sharing your time and your experiences. It's really invaluable. Um, and I hope it helps anyone who watches this in their discernment process. Thank you, Steph. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Peyton. Um, I, I appreciate each and every one of you and the incredible joy and wisdom you, you brought to everything you said. So, so thank you for that. Um, I will also say that the one thing I'll add is that, um, as it was previously mentioned, the, the, the commitment to strong allyship is it, it, it's, it's the other part of the equation. It's this openness. It's this constant learning that it makes my my job uh, really enjoyable as well to, to really create a, a kind and loving community as well. Uh, so that that's the other part of the equation that I think we, we all benefit from as we, we hear from each other and learn from each other. So I just want to say that as well for all those out there who, uh, who are strong allies and, and, and want to be supportive of the LGBTQ plus community at HCS and, and, and all folks at HCS. So, so thank you, thank you all of you who, who join us. Uh, again, uh, we, we invite you to, to any of our upcoming events and we hope you can, you, you can make our virtual open house on November 9th. Um, have a great night and, and stay safe, be well. Bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>